Hello everyone, I'm Guauhtémoc Avila, Superintendent of Schools, and on behalf of our Board of Education, we'd like to share some very important information related to the opening of the new school year. But first, let's go to Ego Nation, where Destiny Lopez will take it away. Thank you, Dr. Avila. My name is Destiny Lopez, graduating senior of the class of 2021, and we are here to give you the ins and outs of in-person instruction. We want to give you peace of mind and make sure you guys are ready for the next year. The Rialto Unified School District is excited to open its doors for traditional school in fall 2021. Our USD staff have been working diligently to make the transition to our fall 2021 school reopening as safe and simple as possible. We can't wait to welcome you back. As our state reaches over 20 million vaccines administered, California has moved to fully reopening our economy. Recently, the California Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and the California Department of Public Health issued updated COVID-19 public health guidance for K-12 schools. According to the guidelines, students benefit from in-person learning. Safely returning to in-person instruction in the fall of 2021 is a state priority. Rialto Unified School District will be following the recently released guidelines and updating our policies and procedures as we hear more from the departments. Rialto Unified School District will return to school in a traditional learning setting, which will be a safe, in-person learning environment as we transition out of the COVID-19 pandemic. In-person learning will be possible by employing safety protocols like distancing, frequent hand washing, and wearing of face coverings. With this model, teachers have the opportunity to see their students in person and will provide quality instruction that ensures each student achieves personal and career fulfillment. Teachers will report to work Monday through Friday and students receive live instruction with the teachers daily. At Rialto Unified School District, safety is our top priority. And as we begin the process of reopening schools, we have prepared extra precautions and cleaning protocols to protect our students, staff, and families. All public facing front offices across all of our schools and facilities have newly installed physical barriers, temperature check machines, and mobile hand washing or sanitizing stations. Elementary school classrooms will be provided plexiglass on individual student desks. Custodians will disinfect plexiglass daily based on the new COVID cleaning schedule. Classroom staff may request plexiglass for their individual desk. Large temperature kiosks, which are capable of scanning 2,500 to 5,000 individuals in 30 minutes, have been installed in secondary school campuses. Smaller temperature kiosks, which are capable of scanning 300 to 500 individuals in 30 minutes, have been installed in our elementary schools and high traffic facilities. Additionally, no touch thermometers have been provided for all schools and facilities for using in smaller groups. Markings to help display social distancing measures and routes designated for entry and exits have been placed in high traffic areas in order to limit direct contact with others. Disposable masks and hand sanitizer will be available for students and staff. Postering reminding students and staff to remain socially distanced and to frequently hand wash to prevent germs from spreading have been placed around school campuses. Daily, high-touch surface cleaning will take place to increase precaution from any germ spread or possible outbreaks. Surfaces like desks, chairs, rails, restrooms, and doors will be routinely cleaned for added safety. The purchase of new tools to help fight COVID-19 with state-of-the-art cleaning devices like electrostatic sprayers that will envelop the virus with cleaning solution will assist in sanitizing classrooms, playgrounds, and hard-to-reach places. Hospital-grade antimicrobial air filters and air supply have been modified to increase the amount of outside air to the highest extent needed. With all the extra added precautions and protocols in place, we aim to minimize risk to our students, staff, and families, thus being able to achieve a safe return to in-person school. As we prepare to welcome back our students for school in the fall, there are a few important procedures you should know. First, it is important to self-screen your child at home every morning for COVID-19 symptoms. If your child is experiencing any symptoms, it is critical that they stay home. Be sure to remind your child to bring their face coverings to school as they are required to wear one on campus, while indoors, and in large gatherings in outside settings. 
a reusable mask will be provided to your child on their first day of school. Additional disposable masks will be available as needed. Masks are not required at recess, passing periods, or in most other outdoor situations. However, masks will be required in a crowd for an extended period of time, such as in the stands at a football game. Be sure to review your child's daily schedule and pick up and drop off your child on time. Students and parents will be encouraged to social distance before or after school. For those arriving to campus in a vehicle, please remain in the vehicle when dropping off or picking up. For those that walk to school, we ask that you do not gather and remain socially distanced. Students will have their temperature checked as they enter the district bus or walk onto campus. If your child is a bus rider, please remain at the bus stop until your child's temperature has been taken. Any student at the school site with a fever or COVID symptoms will be taken to a waiting room and socially distanced from others. Parents will be contacted and required to pick them up from school immediately. While students will be participating in a traditional school setting, some systems, procedures, and events such as assemblies, recesses, and lunchtime may have to remain adjusted to be compliant with public health guidelines. Although we are excited to welcome back our students in an in-person setting, we understand that in-person learning might not be for everyone. RUSD has a K-12 independent study program as an alternative to in-person learning that will be offered to students whose health would be put at risk by in-person instruction as determined by the parent or guardian. The program requires students to change schools while participating in the program, but independent study students will be able to return to in-person instruction at any time during the 2021-2022 school year. If you are interested in enrolling your student in the independent study program, please contact your school's principal or administrator and they will assist you with the referral process. Independent study will be offered at the following locations. We look forward to seeing our students on Monday, August 9th. We've missed their smiling faces and the joy they bring to our schools. Together, we will bridge futures safely. For additional information on site-specific reopening policies and procedures, please check out our website at www.rialto.k12.ca.us or call your child's school site. Hello everyone, I'm Guauhtémoc Avila, Superintendent of Schools, and on behalf of our Board of Education, we'd like to share some very important information related to the opening of the new school year. But first, let's go to Eagle Nation, where Destiny Lopez will take it away. Thank you, Dr. Avila. My name is Destiny Lopez, graduating senior of the class of 2021, and we are here to give you the ins and outs of in-person instruction. We want to give you peace of mind and make sure you guys are ready for the next year. The Rialto Unified School District is excited to open its doors for traditional school in fall 2021. Our USD staff have been working diligently to make the transition to our fall 2021 school reopening as safe and simple as possible. We can't wait to welcome you back. As our state reaches over 20 million vaccines administered, California has moved to fully reopening our economy. Recently, the California Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and the California Department of Public Health issued updated COVID-19 public health guidance for K-12 schools. According to the guidelines, students benefit from in-person learning. Safely returning to in-person instruction in the fall of 2021 is a state priority. Rialto Unified School District will be following the recently released guidelines and updating our policies and procedures as we hear more from the departments. Rialto Unified School District will return to school in a traditional learning setting, which will be a safe, in-person learning environment as we transition out of the COVID-19 pandemic. In-person learning will be possible by employing safety protocols like distancing, frequent hand washing, and wearing of face coverings. With this model, teachers have the opportunity to see their students in person and will provide quality instruction that ensures each student achieves personal and career fulfillment. 
Teachers will report to work Monday through Friday and students receive live instruction with the teachers daily. At Rialto Unified School District, safety is our top priority. And as we begin the process of reopening schools, we have prepared extra precautions and cleaning protocols to protect our students, staff, and families. All public facing front offices across all of our schools and facilities have newly installed physical barriers, temperature check machines, and mobile hand washing or sanitizing stations. Elementary school classrooms will be provided plexiglass on individual student desks. Custodians will disinfect plexiglass daily based on the new COVID cleaning schedule. Classroom staff may request plexiglass for their individual desk. Large temperature kiosks, which are capable of scanning 2,500 to 5,000 individuals in 30 minutes, have been installed in secondary school campuses. Smaller temperature kiosks, which are capable of... Thank you. Good evening, one and all. This is the Rialto Unified School District, regular meeting of the Board of Education for August 25th, 2021. Uh, any individual who requires disability related accommodations or modifications including auxiliary aids and services in order to participate in the board meeting should contact superintendent or designee in writing okay we have our call to order open session comments on closed session agenda items uh, any person wishing to speak on any item on the closed session agenda will be granted three minutes dr avila we have none. Okay. Uh, can I have a motion and a second as provided by law? Uh, thank you. Second. As provided by law, the following are the items for discussion and consideration at the closed session of the board meeting. Um, public employee, employment discipline, dismissal, release, reassignment of employees per government code section 54957. Student expulsions, reinstatements, expulsion enrollments, conference with labor negotiators, agency designated representatives, Guatemoc Avila, Superintendent, Rhea MacGyver Gibbs, Lead Personnel Agent, Personnel Services, and Rhonda Kramer, Lead Personnel Agent, Personnel Services. Employee Organizations, California School Employees Association, Chapter 203, and Rialto Education Association, Communication Workers of America as well. Okay, um, can I have a vote um, to move into closed session? I'm going to call roll. Um, Ms. O'Kelly? Aye. Thank you. Clerk Lewis? Aye. And myself? Aye. Time is 6.02.
Thank you.
Whenever you're ready. Thank you very much. We're back from closed session. Can I have a motion and a second by board members to adjourn closed session, please? So moved. Second. Thank you. And Ms. Walker will not be with us tonight. So, um, Ms. O'Kelly, how do you vote on to adjourn closed session? Aye. Okay, Clerk Lewis? Aye. <clears throat> Vice President Montes? Aye. And myself? Aye. Time 7 p.m. Okay, open session is reconvened at 7 p.m. Uh, we start with Pledge of Allegiance tonight. <clears throat> Would CSEA please lead us? Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. Dr. Avila, a uh, report out of closed session, sir. Yes, uh, we have several. The Board of Education denied the request for an unpaid leave of absence for classified employee number 2653021 from August 25th, 2021 Thanks. through February 25th, 2022. The roll call vote was unanimous. The Board of Education denied the request for an unpaid leave of absence for classified employee number 2704431 from September 7, 2021 through April 29, 2023. The roll call vote was unanimous. The Board of Education voted to uh, deny unpaid leave of absence for classified employee number 2501411 from September 3rd, 2021 through September 3rd, 2022. The roll call vote was as follows. Uh, President Joseph W. Martinez, uh, yes. Vice President Edgar Montes, no. Uh, Clerk Stephanie Lewis, yes. Board uh, member Nancy G. O'Kelly, no. Because there was no majority, the, uh, the default decision is to deny uh, the employee's request. The Board of Education accepted the administrative appointment of Angelica Manso, Student Success Specialist. The roll call vote was unanimous. And the Board of Edu Education accepted the administrative appointment of Noemi Mai, a Student Success Specialist. The roll call vote was unanimous. And that is all. Thank you, Dr. Avila. Okay, um, it's kind of obvious we're trying to adhere to mask, to the mask here, and um, <clears throat> I agree with everyone out there. All right, um, there's something to read out before we move on, uh, and this is resolution numbers for the following board items will be corrected as follows. Discussion action item F, as in Frank, 6, page 85, Resolution number should read 212208, not 202108. So, wrong year on it. Um, discussion action item F, Frank 7, page 87. Resolution number should read 212209 and not 202109. So, um, can I hear a motion? to adopt the agenda as amended. So move, Clerk Lewis. Thank you, we have uh, a motion. Thank you, Clerk Lewis and uh, Vice President Montez for the second. And uh, vote by board members, um, Ms. O'Kelly. Aye. Clerk Lewis. Aye. Uh, Vice President Montez. Aye. And myself, aye. Okay, we have a presentation tonight. Uh, California Voting Rights Act to process and process to transition to trustee area elections. Uh, presentation on California Voting Rights Act and process to transition to trustee area elections by Mr. Trevor Sims, attorney at law with Lozana Smith. Welcome again, good to see you. Do we Glad know you're you from, healthy. Do we know you from somewhere? 
Yes, you do, sir. Oh, there he is. <laughs> Welcome back. Thank you, thank you. Good evening. <clears throat> So good evening, board and Superintendent Avila and cabinet and other staff members and I presume members of the public who are joining us uh, virtually. Uh, my name is Trevin Sims. I'm a partner with the law firm of Lozano Smith. And later this evening, the board has on its agenda the consideration of a resolution to begin the process to transition to by trustee area elections. And I was asked to do a brief presentation um, on that tonight. So I'm going to walk through the presentation. I'm obviously open to any questions the board may have as I proceed through it or any questions at the end. So what we'll cover is the district's current uh, method of election. And we'll talk about the thing that's really driving this consideration to change that method of election, and that's the California Voting Rights Act. Then we'll talk about the process for transitioning to by trustee area elections and talk about a couple of other considerations um, that are relevant. So the district's current method of election is what's called an at-large election. And we'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, but by education code, the district is legally entitled to use and can lawfully use three different types of election method. That's the at-large method it currently uses, uh, what's called the hybrid at-large method, and then by district or by trustee area elections. So one question is, if the education code and longstanding has allowed the district to conduct its board elections using the current at-large system, why change? And the reason for that is the California Voting Rights Act. And the California Voting Rights Act was enacted in 2002. And what it essentially says is you cannot use, or any public agency, local agency in the state, school districts, cities, community college districts, are prohibited from using an at-large type system that results in what's called racially polarized voting. And racially polarized voting essentially is where members of protected minority groups are um, unsuccessful in their ability to elect candidates of their choice or otherwise impact and influence the outcome of, of elections. So we talked about the fact that it's designed to prohibit at-large systems that permit racially polarized voting. And it's designed to give members of minority groups an opportunity to elect candidates of their choice and influence those outcomes. And the California Voting Rights Act is largely based on the Federal Voting Rights Act that was enacted in 1965. But it's designed to and does give greater protection to California voters than the Federal Voting Rights Act, and that was its intent. So what is an at-large election? We have the, the graphic here. Basically, an at-large election is um, the trustees can live anywhere within the district's boundaries, and voters throughout the entire boundary of the district uh, vote for each trustee member, okay? Then you have what are called by trustee area elections. And this is what the board is considering moving to tonight. Through this method, the board will determine and select trustee areas. And so those are the five colored 
um, squares or shapes that I have on the map there. And voters from each of those trustee areas will only vote for the trustee in their area and only residents of that trustee area can run for the trustee position in that area. The last option is what's called this hybrid model. And you'll see in the graphic here, you have trustee areas, just like you would have in the by trustee area example in the prior slide. But in this example, all the voters in the district still vote for each of the trustees. So in effect, you still have the same sort of voting structure that you do in it at large election system. And that's important because the California Voting Rights Act specifically treats this sort of hybrid model in the same way as it treats an at large election system. So that under the CVRA, the only election system that is immune from challenge and is sort of a safe harbor now for uh, public agencies in California is the by trustee area system in the prior slide. So we've got a neighboring district that uses this system, the hybrid model, where the voters can vote for all five or seven trustees. The only restriction is the candidate has to live in that, that area, but all voters still vote for all candidates. Mm -hmm. But this model you're, you're saying is, doesn't work as well as the previous one. Yeah, under the Yeah, under the Voting Rights Act, this is defined the same as an at-large election system and therefore it is subject to challenge. So any agency that uses this model is subject to a challenge that that model results in racially polarized voting. Whereas if you use the by trustee area election system, uh, it's a safe harbor and there is no basis for challenge of that system under the California Voting Rights Act. Okay. So the other thing that the Voting Rights Act did was it specifically allowed voters to um, demand that local agencies transition to the by trustee area election. And once an agency receives that demand letter, it has the option to begin to transition to the by trustee air election system, or it can fight it. Um, but those fights, and there are many agencies that have attempted to fight them, um, they have not been successful. And it can result in significant attorney's fees. Some of these fights have resulted in attorney's fees having to be paid to the attorney representing the challenging voter in the millions of dollars, in addition to the legal fees incurred by the public agency to fight it. So under that scenario, um, given the potential high cost of, of challenge and fighting and the fact that really no local agencies have been successful in that challenge, uh, even after s expending millions of dollars, the question for most local agencies in California has been since the adoption of the California Voting Rights Act, do we, do we initiate proactively a transition to by trustee area elections? or do we wait to see if we get a demand letter and determine whether we're gonna fight it? And so by the board's consideration of its resolution later tonight, uh, the board is looking to take that proactive step and transition on its own. So let's talk a little bit about that transition process. The first step is for the district to adopt what's called a resolution of intent to transition. And like I said, that's what the board is considering tonight. If that is adopted, then 
the board will have to have several hearings following that. The first are what we call pre-map hearings, and the board will have to have two pre-map hearings. And this is designed essentially to educate the board, educate your constituency about what this process is, what it's going to look like, how do you develop trustee areas, um, what factors are considered, and give your community an opportunity to give you feedback and their thoughts on what's important in the consideration of the development of those trustee areas. And you'll hire a demographer to, to do this. They'll also present to the board and the community about what factors factor into that. And you have to have two of these hearings before you even develop any maps. And those two hearings have to be within 30 days of each other. Okay. Once you've had those two hearings, the demographer will prepare usually a few draft maps. It's usually more than one, two or three. And then you'll have what are called map consideration hearings. And the map consideration hearings are designed similar to the pre-map hearings, but only now we'll have maps in hand. And we'll have to post those maps seven days before each of those hearings so that the community can see what we're, what we're proposing and have the opportunity to give the board and the demographer input as to uh, the pros and cons of those particular maps. And again, you'll have two of these hearings. So you have the first one, and then you'll have to have that second hearing within 45 days of the first map consideration hearing. Now, the maps can and usually do change somewhat between that first map consideration hearing and the second, based upon feedback from the board to the demographer, based upon feedback from the public. So for the second uh, map consideration hearing, those new or revised maps also have to be posted seven days before that hearing to allow input from the public as to those revised maps. After that second map consideration hearing, final maps will be developed for the five trustee areas. And then you'll have a final map adoption hearing where this board will adopt the map that it's going to submit to the county registrar of voters, submit to the county committee for approval, and say, this is what we want our trustee areas to look like. So got a little bit ahead of myself. Next step will be um, submission to the county committee for approval. Um, the county committee itself must hold at least one hearing on um, the proposed map. Uh, previously, there had to be a specific waiver for um, uh, an election on that map, but because of a uh, statute that was enacted last year goes into effect January 1, 2022. We don't need that waiver anymore, so effectively, the county committee's approval of that map that's submitted to them will be the final action um, to implement the new trustee areas. So here's kind of a rough estimate of what this process would look like. These are sort of draft um, proposed dates, not finalized at all, but this is kind of what we would be working towards in terms of the pre-map hearings, um, the map consideration hearings, and the final adoption. And all this is subject to retention of a developer, of a demographer, and then the release and receipt of the actual 2020 census data, which is expected, I think, late September, early October about now. But we would work with your staff, and staff would work with the board to come up with a final um, schedule. So a couple of final thoughts and considerations. Uh, it's important to know that this does not affect the terms of incumbent board members. You will, you will serve out your existing terms. Um, 
And this doesn't at all change the boundaries of the district. It just kind of divides up the district into trustee areas. Uh, and there'll be more discussion about that at the map consideration hearings. So obviously, you'll need a team of folks to do this. You have legal counsel. We'll hire a demographer. We'll need to work with staff on logistics for notices and board agendas and, and getting this out to the public for input. Um, and you know, working with your PR folks and others, again, to blast this to the community for, for input. Um, like any other project, track our efforts, consider all feedback, um, and you know, we're, a, a lot of agencies are doing this process right now. So you may hear out there that cities, counties, other people are doing this, and they're on much tighter timelines than the district. So for our purposes, our target to get this done is really at the latest February, March of 2022. So like I said, tonight, the board will consider whether it wants to start this process. Any questions? Okay. Well, thank you very much for your, oh. As soon as I get back in place. Okay. Each president seems to get real good at musical chairs. <laughs> Okay, um, I have heard, I don't know if it remains the same or not, um, that the board can draw the map any way it wants. You know, big, lean line, big again, north and south of the uh, boundaries of the, the district, let's say, and cut it up any way they can or they want. Is that still so? That's not necessarily so. Okay. So there are certain parameters that the board has to follow in constructing and configuring uh, those boundaries. And this is the role and work of your demographer primarily, and they'll talk in more detail about this. But essentially, there are a couple of major factors. Um, one is um, equally populated. And this is by people, not necessarily voters. And so there's a, it needs to be relatively equal in terms of population. Uh, it needs to be contiguous. And so you can't have like a, a patch. Here and then another neighborhood over there. Right, right. And you, you jump this area, pick this area, pick this area. It needs to be contiguous. Uh, there can be some minor exceptions to that. I've heard one demographer talk about Catalina Island is not contiguous literally with anything, but it's functionally contiguous. Um, another is that um, they need to, there's this idea of compactness. And I think of it similar to the, to the contiguous, but it's that notion of it, it can't look like a snake. Right? Uh, it can't look like a giraffe. <laughs> uh, if you're going to compare it to an animal, maybe it needs to more look like a, a, a tortoise who's hiding in their shell. So this notion of it's, it's compact. And you, you might hear, have heard the word gerrymandering, mm -hmm. where you know, they'll snake these, ter these areas in order to give preference to certain candidates or whatever it may be. Um, that's not allowed. Um, you need to consider what they call community of interest. And that includes the groups that are protected by the Voting Rights Act, which is racial, ethnic, language minorities. But there can be other uh, communities of interest. Uh, it could be it's a farming community. It, it could be... Um, uh, trying to come up with some other examples. But there, there's a bunch of different potential communities of interest that you would consider. 
And then they also look at kind of local boundary lines. So if um, the best example I was given is if you have a community college and uh, or a high school district and they have all these elementary feeder districts. So they might look at kind of the areas of the feeder districts, um, look at your another community of interest for, for you guys, your schools. And so different schools in different areas, they might be a basis for looking at how you want to construct your trustee areas. Okay, when you um, say numbers, I was of the, the, the thought that it was um, by ADA, by student population. Am I hearing it's by population, the yes. general public? Yes, it's not student population, no. Okay, and um, hmm, okay, that, that's interesting. So we can consider the feeder district, meaning we're all one unified school district, but one high school is fed by a junior high who's, that's fed by two or three or more elementary schools. Yeah, I think that would fall under the umbrella of a community of interest. Okay. Board? I think the presentation was very well put together and explained. All right. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. Thank you too. Off the clock. <laughs> just, just teasing you. Okay. Um, now we have the comments section. Public comments not on the agenda at this time. Any person wishing to speak on any item not on the agenda will be granted three minutes. Dr. Avila. Yes, thank you, President Martinez. First, we have uh, Tobin Brinker. Welcome. Good evening, uh, Tobin Brinker, a teacher at Frisbee Middle School, speaking on my own behalf. Uh, I wanted to start with a, a quick positive story. Uh, you know, the school year is off to a great start. And uh, I was leaving school yesterday, and I see a couple, and they start waving me over. And it's uh, students, former students of mine, that had my class in 2002. They're married today, and they told me that they met in my class. And it was such a heartwarming moment. And now they have a child at Frisbee. And you know, I've been there for 22 years, and it's, it's, it's why I teach. Um, and it just keeps me going, and it's so energizing. So I wanted to share that story with you. Um, now I want to talk to you about some of the issues that we're dealing with, right? Obviously COVID has affected us in our school sites. Uh, one of the issues that we're seeing is uh, students in water, right? And we know that we had to close our water fountains. We put in these uh, water bottle dispensers and um, the bottle filling stations. Um, we've got to do a better job. And I'm, I'm particularly concerned for tomorrow, right? It's supposed mm -hmm. to be 103 degrees out. And we have a lot of kids who are coming into class, you know, they don't have water bottles, they can't use the regular fountains, and, and so they're, they're thirsty. And some of the teachers have bought water on their own to give kids, um, but we have got to have water for these kids. And so that's just an issue, I want to put that out there. Um, and then there are some issues that our teachers need clarification on. Um, one of them is um, about independent study. Right, and so we've got this independent study program. Excuse me, uh, Mr. Brinker, you said you're speaking on your own, I am. and yet you're bringing other people in. You know, I'm speaking on issues that are being talked about at my school site. Okay, yeah, Appreciate I'm, I'm not representing anybody other than myself. These are issues I've heard about that I feel are worthy of discussion here, so Thank I want to make you sure you're aware of them. Um, so independent study, um, uh, it's an issue that people are asking about. We're being asked to provide lessons for several weeks for students mm -hmm. that are on independent study. Uh, I think teachers would appreciate some clarification on how that whole program works and, and, and what our role in is it as, as the regular teacher when a kid leaves our class to go to independent study. And I just think there's clarification that's needed. Um, also when we're doing notification, when there's been exposure at our school site, there are people who are feeling like they're left out. Um, and specifically the people I'm hearing from are special ed teachers and the instructional assistants that are in the same classes. And the regular teacher gets notified, but the special ed teacher, the, the aides are not always being notified. So I just want to make sure that that's something that you're aware of and it's being taken care of. Um, a big issue that is occurring, we, I think we all know about this, is we have a sub shortage. And because of people being out, having to take some time off um, because of COVID, um, we're, we're, we're having issues and teachers are being asked to sub a lot in classrooms. Mm -hmm. Um, we are more than willing to help out our colleagues and, and, and carry that load. 
but it creates an issue for us as we go forward. And so I'm, I'm really interested in working together to solve these problems, right? Because our teachers will get burned out mm -hmm. if, if we ask them to, to, to sub day after day after day. So we've got to come up with some sort of solution together. Um, and then finally, I just want to say thank you to you all, because I know that this has put a lot of strain on everybody at every level in this district. And I want you to know we're in it together, right? And we're going to find solutions together. So this is not me griping. This is me saying, hey, these are things I want to work on you with. These are things we all need to know about. And, and you guys, obviously, as the policy leaders, need to know that. So thank you. OK, thank you. And um, Dr. Afila, would you please look into that? Uh, but remember, we can't negotiate with anybody other than their representative. So yes, point well taken. Next, we have uh, Michael Montano. Welcome. Good, to Good see evening, you. everyone. Uh, I'd like to bring up three things, and one is just uh, reiterating what Mr. Brinker said. Uh, uh, water access for all our students at all our sites, K through 12, it's not happening at some sites. Um, mm -hmm. Some students are having to buy water. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that, again, that should be addressed. Uh, the second one is uh, there are concerns in transparency in regard to COVID. Uh, one solution might be to provide a dashboard for our parents and students in public to see maybe with uh, how many cases per site. Uh, that way it might also, if we can see sites that have very low numbers, hey, what are they doing there? Uh, the third thing that I'd like to address, uh, which is kind of personal to me, is uh, uh, first I'd like to start off by asking you a, a question, not, not to be answered, just a question for you to ponder. Uh, was there a teacher or class you had in high school that positively influenced your life? What I want to address is our students being forced to repeat A through G, cl uh, a through G classes they may have gotten a D in. High school should help students explore new horizons, not cage them like a bird without room to fly. Administrators and counselors are giving misinformation and telling our students in order to graduate, they have to retake A through G classes they got a D in. By doing so, we are denying our students access to other classes, maybe a class that will positively affect their life, like a short story class I took with Mr. Anakire that planted a seed with me. 30% of all people with degrees do not work, are only 30% of people with degrees actually work in the field they get the degree in. How many people do we know as adults knew what they wanted to do at 18? So to pigeonhole our, our, our students now um, is, is kind of doing them injustice. Instead of a very narrow bridge, let's widen that bridge that connects students to their future aspirations. Not ours, their future aspirations. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Avila, do we have anyone else? We have uh, Mirna Ruiz. That's all we have. Okay. Um, thank you, Dr. Avila. We move on to public comments on the agenda. Should Ms. Reese uh, show up, we can always tag her onto this. Uh, any person wishing to speak on any item on the agenda will be granted three minutes. We do not have any. Okay. Well, we will continue. Uh, comments from Association Executive Board Members, Rialto Education Association, REA. Welcome. Hello. Good evening, board. So good to see you guys once again. Good evening, Dr. Avila and staff. Always good to see you guys. Um, we just wanted to say we're excited the kids are back. So thank you once again. Um, a lot's going on. A lot is going on, but we just still help are happy that you guys are helping us to move forward 
through this COVID situation. We're also very grateful on how quickly we are getting teachers and staff hired so that we can get these different positions filled. And we just want to encourage you to keep up the good work so that we can get everything filled and everyone um, settled in at each site. So really, that's it. I just wanted to say hello tonight and thank you for everything that you guys are doing. Have a good night. Thank you. You do the same. Okay, uh, California School Employees Association, CSEA. Hi, guys. Uh, good evening, board members, Dr. Avila, and uh, everybody in attendance. Uh, first, I'd like to say that we are also very happy that uh, the students are back. But uh, I would also like to point out that this brings unrelenting stress for all employees, you, everybody. <laughs> Um, especially our classified members as they try so desperately to keep up with the directives of their administrators mm -hmm. and try to be the know all and do all persons at each site, do all things at mm -hmm. each site. I think you can agree that our members really do try to do their best. With that being said, I would like to enlist the help of all administrators, teachers, and my classified members to remember to have grace and patience with each other. We are all human. We have two arms, two legs, and one brain. We just need to stop and be patient. Um, I'd like to thank um, you all, especially the health clerks, thank all our classified members, but especially health clerks, attendance clerks, secretaries, school office staff members for going nonstop above and beyond. They have dealt with many COVID obstacles, many parent concerns and complaints, all in the name of getting our students to where they need to be daily. They are our unsung, unsung heroes. Secondly, we the CSEA board are very concerned and anxious to get to the table regarding the new mandatory COVID uh, requirements. We are still waiting to hear when we can do that and would love to get some dates from Rhonda when she is available. I thought I saw her here, but she's not no more. <laughs> um, but that is all I have for now. I would like to thank you all for doing what you do to keep us all safe and to make the, the good decisions that you are making. And I hope that it, it continues. Thank you. Thank you. OK, Communication Workers of America, CWA. OK. Uh, Rialto School Managers Association, RSMA. Welcome. Good evening, Board of Education. Our president, uh, Mr. Martinez, Dr. Avila, innovation team and viewing audience, Angela Brantley, um, RSMA president, and I too uh, agree with Ms. Acosta who just spoke in regards to the appreciation that we have for our staff and I think tonight namely for our site leaders, our district mm -hmm. leaders. Um, I wanted to just commend them, um, whether it's at the site level, department leads, our classified um, certificated and supervisory for all the hard work that they're doing in supporting of our students. Um, it has not been easy, but it's been worth it for our kids. Mm -hmm. And I want our leaders to know that we see them as well. We see our classified staff, we see our certificated staff, but we see our leaders as well and how hard they're working in their long hours. Um, we usually plan for a variety of events for RSMA monthly, um, whether it's professional development for our, our leaders or whether it is um, opportunities to get together and support each other, encourage each other. Uh, we wanted to start this year with a clothing drive. So our secretaries did an amazing job this spring doing a drive for, for jeans and socks to support our clothing tree here in the district. And so RSMA would like to use the month of September to do a shirt and hoodie drive um, for our students here in the district. Um, we will have two locations, one here um, on Walnut, and it will be in the business services office where Mr. Harris um, resides. And then the other location will be um, on Willow, 260 South Willow, where our registration center and student services. And if you would like to support our, our kids and donate new items, new shirts, whether it's from uh, TK, or preschool age, up to high school age. And you know, our, our kids like hoodies, especially the middle school and high school kids. Mm -hmm. um, if we can make those donations throughout the month of September, let's, let's band together and let's help our, our babies. Um, I had this idea about, you know, the, the benefits of helping, right? 
it serves more than one purpose. One, you're also you're definitely going to be a blessing to that kid that receives it, but it also comes back to us. And I think about those endorphins and the oxytocin that's released when you're doing something for someone else. And if if you get one dose of that for a given one hoodie, how many you know if it's exponential, and if I give two, if I get four doses and three, nine doses. Uh, let's get all those good vibes, right, in terms of being a blessing to others. And then just lastly, um, you may or may not be aware of the, the fires that are taking place in, in Lytle Creek, and just our prayers are with the families up there, um, our kids, and some of our um, employees as well. So um, hope to come back in September 8th and let you know what our progress is on those shirts and hoodies. But starting September 1st, the, um, those uh, containers will be in those two locations, and we hope that we can get a good turnout to support our kids. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Brantley. <clears throat> okay. Um, comments from the superintendent, Dr. Avila. Thank you, President Martinez. And today I simply want to limit my comments to acknowledge our staff and families, but especially our staff at the sites and at district office who are working extremely, extremely hard. Uh, excited to be back, to have the kids on campuses, but I know it's being done under a lot of stress, a lot of pressure uh, to educate our kids, to support our families, but doing so in a very safe uh, environment. As we know, the new variant has really taken off. We are not immune from it. We've seen it with uh, cases at many of our schools among some kids and or staff members or both. And so I can only uh, emphasize the importance of maintaining all safety protocols, both while on our campuses and at home, uh, to make sure that we not allow this uh, virus to overtake all of the joy and excitement that we're currently experiencing uh, with seeing our kids and our staff members back uh, on mm -hmm. our sites, trying to do uh, the best that they can to educate our kids. So uh, emphasis uh, there and each of the comments uh, that, was, uh, that were made uh, earlier today, uh, I would be more than happy to have staff or me personally look into each of them to make sure that our kids have the water that they uh, need to have on our campuses and to make sure that communication transparency uh, is taking place as promised. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Avila. Okay, uh, comments from members of the board. Uh, Member O'Kelly. Okay, thank you. Um, I was just gonna emphasize and thank Tobin for sharing the concerns of the staff with us. We need to know what your concerns and issues mm -hmm. are in order we, in order for us to address them effectively. I was very uh, disappointed to hear about the water issue. I had thought of that because I said, well, aren't all the water fountains closed? And I thought, well, how are they getting water? And we, we are in for another six weeks of heat, at least. So um, we need to jump on that one right away and make sure that we have water at all of the schools. I want to say that our certificated and classified staff are doing an outstanding job of meeting the needs of our students. Everybody is working extremely hard and it is a very stressful time for them. So I want them to know how much they are appreciated and thank them for everything they do because without them, we are nothing. They are truly the heart of education. Stay safe, everyone. Thank you, Ms. O'Kelly. Okay, Clerk Lewis. Um, remember put this close. When I'm looking at this glass and, you know, I was thinking last year this glass was empty. We're all on distance learning. Now we're back in school. It's not perfect. So is it half empty or half full? You know, the teachers are working and teachers are getting sick, so that takes a little water out your glass, right? But then other people are stepping up, and they're pouring in. And I just found out that the district will supply, you know, tests for your student to return. Uh, some district, you have to go to Walgreens or you have to stack up at home and test your own kids. So, you know, we're constantly pouring into this glass, right? We're trying to make things better and we're trying to keep our school um, open. But, you know, COVID, don't care. And I would like to say that Delta is the only variant, but it's not. There's more. And there's more because it's an organism. 
So we have to stay vigilant. We have to stay home. We have to make sure if our kids are sick for any reason, this is not the time to send them to school. And we have to support each other. I was just so excited um, to know that we are constantly evolving and changing. And a lot of times you wanna know, you want a policy, you want things action, but life changes and changes are always gonna occur. And when we're dealing with something as an organic and how it's going to process in everyone's body or not, uh, we have to be um, 100%. I'm not sure you want to drive up to your school and see the COVID numbers. That gives a lot of anxiety mm. <laughs> and it makes kids anxious. So, but I know the staff is always working out of way to get that information, but they're thinking of our mental health, our emotional health, the neighborhood health. There's a lot of factor. Sometimes you want to know, you know, you get on a plane and say there was four accidents in gate four, you know, <laughs> that's a downer. So I think the information is important, but we have to try to think, what am I pouring back into? Some things that are always going to be holes that's going to leak, but what can I plug up? What can I be a part of the solution? Um, I just think it's wonderful that we're still open and we're still moving towards progress. Our kids are happy. Our parents are working hard. Uh, they've become our team member. Um, they become partners. Our administration is constantly, I, I'm sure the, the leader cabinet and the board and the students and the teachers and everyone, every time you turn on your news, she's like, what now? But Rialto is different than the whole state of California. The state of California is not Florida. <laughs> the state of California is not Texas. Our school district is not other. So sometimes you cannot really get so upset, but we have to focus on our present. Uh, thank you very much. Vice President Montez. Thank you, Board President Mr. Martinez. And I, I just want to also piggyback on uh, some of the comments uh, that were made earlier. Um, we know uh, that it's a very stressful time. Mm -hmm. uh, nerves are at, at an all-time high. We would like, I would like to just encourage everyone to remain calm uh, as possible, to uh, remain diligent, uh, to keep an eye, a uh, close eye on things. Uh, I dropped my son off at school here down the street and I see the uh, custodians uh, checking kids in, checking their temperature in at one of the entrance at the schools. Um, I see aides helping uh, the administration, checking the kids in at the school, um, people directing traffic. I saw one of the supervisors for safety and security the other day uh, with the uh, stop sign uh, cro uh, helping, crossing helping guard. the kids. Crossing guard. Yeah, help, you know, <coughs> taking on the role of a crossing guard. Mm -hmm. So right, right now, it, it's clear to us that all hands are on deck. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and and my heart goes out to uh, the principals, the um, the admin, <coughs> the uh, the offices, the the, the school uh, uh, central offices um, that are just trying uh, desperately to do as much as they can, as safe as they can with what they have. Mm -hmm. um, we've got a lot of people calling off work um, because maybe they don't feel well and, and that's good that they stay home if they mm -hmm. don't feel well. Uh, we encourage our students and, and, and everyone not to come to school if they're, if they're not feeling well. And then you've got other people that are just afraid, afraid uh, of what's going on. Um, we don't have enough you know, we're understaffed, we're, we're, we don't have enough uh, subs. There's not a, enough substitutes out there to cover everybody. You've got people in the classrooms filling in for uh, classes that they're not supposed to be uh, filling for. Uh, lots of teachers, I'm, I'm assuming, are subbing themselves for other teachers. Uh, everybody's overworked, everybody's overstressed, and, and we just want everyone to know that we know um, everybody's hurting and everybody's worried and, and we're trying our best to maintain uh, our sanity our, our maintain this a, a level of safety maintain a level of uh, calmness um, 
because really this whole thing can just fall apart any day. Yeah. Um, and, and we hope and we pray, we keep our fingers crossed that uh, we can just continue, even though we're struggling and some of us are carrying a lot of weight, if we can just hold on for those, mm -hmm. for those, for our students' smiles, mm -hmm. for our parents' smiles, uh, you know, for our coworkers' smiles. Um, it, 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 it's what keeps us going. Uh, but again, like I said at the last meeting, if push comes to shove, and it just becomes unbearable or uh, serious health concerns begin to arise and we start finding out about uh, people being seriously hospitalized, uh, it's one thing to be quarantined and then come back to work or to the classroom. Mm -hmm. It's another thing to start finding out that people are seriously being hospitalized. Uh, I would like to encourage everyone to, be vac to get vaccinated if they're not vaccinated. I do understand uh, people's personal beliefs in regards to the vaccines, and I just want to make it clear, I used to be an anti-vaxxer. I didn't used to believe in vaccines before, but after seeing what this pandemic has done to loved ones, to friends and family, neighbors, when I was quarantined in March, I seen an ambulance pull up and pull one of my neighbors with a stretcher out their house, and it's, it's scary. So. Um, I've been vaccinated, my whole family's been vaccinated, and, and, and I just, and uh, at home, not all my other families at other households, but uh, everybody's entitled to their beliefs, and we just, uh, I just would like to encourage everybody to be vaccinated. Um, I, I think people should be more afraid of the actual uh, COVID than, than, the, than the vaccine, but for whatever reason, it seems to be the other way around. Um, I, I do believe that we can protect each other better uh being vaccinated and and um and i'll just leave it at that but if not at the very least continue to use your safety precautions if you're within six feet of somebody put on your mask wear your mask um let's continue to ask parents to drop when they drop off their kids or pick them up uh, and they come to close proximity to other parents and staff members to use their masks um and uh, constantly encourage everyone to wash their hands and sanitize and do as best mm -hmm. as we can otherwise it's just we're not going to make it past this flu season, flu season. so with that i don't want to um i don't want to come off as pessimistic but we, we do just need to f stay focused and and uh, my heart goes out to everyone at all the school sites and at the entire district here at the district office who's just uh who's worried and, and just uh doing as best as they can and trying to um, pull those two ends of the face up towards a smile because it can become overwhelming sometimes. So yeah. um, if there's anything I can do as a school board member, um, as a member of this community, uh, I'd be more than happy to help in any way that I can. We're very limited to, you know, I know there's a lot of, a lot of volunteers out there that want to come onto the campuses and right now might not be able to so easily or might be encouraged not to um but then again there are some school sites that might need that help so mm -hmm. um whatever we can do contact the superintendent's office and um and we'll just play by ear and try as best as we can and with that thanks again to to everybody for everything and let's continue to just uh do the do the best we can thank you thank you vice president montez <clears throat> If you haven't realized it yet, everyone's on the front line. And there's nobody, not enough people behind you to hold you up, to back you up. So you're just going to have to uh, do the best you can. Keep a smile on your face. Keep kindness, uh, you know, as in your spirit. But being on the front line takes a lot of toll. And um, I appreciate everyone. Uh, thank you to all my staff family. Um, thank you for uh, everyone for bringing the reports in. We need to know these things. But I'm wondering how many students throw their bottles away after they're finished. Refill them. Don't throw them away. Try to keep a bottle for the day. 
that'll help you because um, there's only so many bottles that can get to a campus every day. And if you're tossing it, well, you're being your own worst enemy then, just to be frank, because you need that water. Again, students try and keep the bottle for the day. Uh, don't throw it away. Reuse it. Everyone is stressing. Um, <clears throat> back to the students real quick. Schools started an hour later this year. Uh, California said, okay, well, they need their sleep. Students will perform better. And this is to students as well as parents. That's not to stay up another hour. <laughs> That's to go to bed at the same time and sleep one more hour. That's the only way you're going to get your rest. Um, when you get to be an adult, yeah, you'll, you'll appreciate naps. <laughs> okay, moving forward. <clears throat> I'll try and put my mask on and read through foggy glasses. <laughs> Public hearing, fourth quarter Williams Settlement Legislation Quarterly Uniform Complaint Report. April through June 2021, page 15. And that is item D as in Delta 1. <clears throat> okay, that's public information only. And D is in Delta 2, more public information. Fourth quarter Williams report, April through June, fiscal year 2020 and 2021, or through 2021. So that is available on page 16. So 15 and 16 are those Williams reports, if you're interested. Okay, we move to the consent calendar. All items on the consent calendar will be acted upon in one motion unless pulled by Board of Education members or the superintendent for individual action. So moved. Thank Second. you. Thank you. Do we have any polls or discussion? Seeing none, okay. Um, we're going to take the whole thing at, at once. Ms. O'Kelly, how do you vote? Aye. Uh, Clerk Lewis? Aye. Uh, Vice President Montes. Aye. And myself, aye. They pass unanimously. We move on to F, Frank, as in on page 9. Agreement with Erickson Hall Construction to provide construction management services for the two story cl classroom building at Eisenhower High School. So glad to finally see this coming through. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're not wearing green again. <laughs> okay, motion and second, please. So moved. Second. Okay, and this is to approve an agreement with Erickson Hall Construction to provide construction management services for the construction of two new two-story classroom buildings at Eisenhower High School, effective August 26, 2021 through December 31st, 2023 in the amount not to exceed $2,237,740, including reimbursables and to be paid from Fund 21, General Obligation Bond Measure Y Series D. Uh, thank you everyone who's stretching the, those dollars. Greatly appreciate it. Is this the last of the Measure Y bond monies? And they've got a couple things on here they're using bond money for, so we still have some there, apparently. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Eric? Series D. Go ahead. Good evening, Board of Education, uh, President Martinez, Vice President Montes, Welcome. Clerk Lewis, uh, Member O'Kelly, Superintendent uh, Avila. Um, you're quite right, we're stretching every bit of it as we can. Um, once we have completed these two two-story buildings at Eisenhower and then taking care of some marquee um, at some of our sites, the funds will be expended. Okay. Thank you for so. stretching it that far though. Yes. yes. And keep in mind, I believe, I don't have the exact figure, but this is only part of the 20 plus million dollars that are left. This is going for this particular piece. The bulk of it will go to the physical construction right. of the building. Absolutely. Yeah. But yes, excellent. this is like the last pocket of money that we have from mm -hmm. the project. Absolutely. Okay. Excellent. Okay. Uh, There's a Miss O'Kelly. Uh, about mm -hmm. the item, 
I, when I read the, the write-up in the back, it said that part of the agreement would be to remove the portables, right, from like the A and B wing. And I'm wondering, where are we going to put classes that would have been in the portables until the new buildings are built? Angie, Derek, if you can answer that, Angie is here too. Yes, so we are at the very, very beginning stages and we're um, bringing teams together, including teachers, um, special education staff, and school site administration staff, along with the superintendent and cabinet to um, come up with the design and the location. There is a rough draft, but it's in the developmental stages at this point, and then it will be a collaborative effort on the final resting place for those, but um, there is a location chosen initially um, where we think that would be a good fit, and I'll let Miss Angie Lopez, our agent for facilities management, um, talk to you a little bit more about those two locations, should you choose. Yeah, and I think the question yeah. is where will those kids be located during the construction? Right, right. So. Okay. Welcome, Ms. Lopez. Um, welcome to the district as well. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Good evening. Good evening, President Martinez. Good evening, members of the board, Dr. Avila. Yes, um, uh, as Dr. Mr. Harris said, um, we are just in the initial stages of the conceptual design for these two um, classroom buildings. So what our intent is in order to minimize the impact over the students, that the location of the buildings are going to be in a place where we can keep as many portables during the construction. Oh, okay. So we are trying to, um, like we're in the conceptual design part, but that is what our intent is, to try to maintain as many portables as we can um, in order to um, minimize the impact of, this, uh, of the students during the construction. Okay, thank you. Sure, you're welcome. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, seeing none, ready to vote board? Mm -hmm. Okay, um, Ms. O'Kelly, how do you vote? Aye. Clerk Lewis? Aye. Vice President Montez? Aye. And myself, aye. Thank you, board. Okay, F2. Agreement with Renau Clark Architects to provide architectural and design services for the two-story classroom buildings at Eisenhower High School. Motion, any second? So please? moved. Second. Okay. And this is to approve an agreement with Renau Clark Architects to provide architectural and design services for two new two-story classroom buildings at Eisenhower High School. Effective August 26, 2021 through June 30th, 2024, in the amount not to exceed $1,325,000 and 000, 000 after that, um, including reimbursables and to be paid from Fund 21, General Obligation Bond, Measure Y, Series D. Okay, any questions or comments? Okay, ready to vote. Uh, Ms. O'Kelly. Aye. Uh, Clerk Lewis. Aye. Montez, aye. I and myself, aye. Okay, agreement with Scholast Scholastic Education. Motion and second, please. So move. Second. Thank you. To approve a renewal agreement with Scholastic Literacy Pro to assist with independent reading during the 2021 2021-2022 yeah, school year. <coughs> I'm getting foggy, folks. Effective, uh, my glasses, <laughs> I've been <coughs> foggy already. Effective August 28th, 2021 through June 30th, 2022, at a cost not to exceed $61,807 and to be paid from the general fund, Title uh, IV. Okay, uh, questions or comments? Uh, I'd just like to make a statement. When I read what was in the back of the agenda about this program, I was very impressed. The results they had during uh, Bridge Academy Summer School were phenomenal for first through fourth grade. Their Lexile uh, scores increased 50% to 64% for different grade levels. And that's just amazing for such a short period of time. So. Plus, the teachers really loved using the Literacy Pro, so I'm very glad we're, we're investing in that. Ditto. Okay, any other questions or comments? Yeah, um, Ms. Uh, Chavez, Dr. Chavez, um, this 
this particular program, could you explain to um, the parents listening at home how this can help or how it is helping? She was already whizzing down the hallway. <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't hear the whole question because I was coming down the hallway. Miss O'Kelly, please. Uh, oh, some, I'm sorry, uh, yes. Some, sometimes um, parents say, hey, you guys are constantly approving these programs. Mm -hmm. How are these programs helping our children? And uh, although we might be informed on uh, the success right. of these programs and, and the services these vendors provide. Could you explain to the public um, a, deep, a little, how would I say, like a summary of how this is helping our students? Um, well, essentially, you know, we've had this, we had the struggle under distance learning with how do we have students, you know, have access to wide reading, just reading for pleasure you know, reading to learn, reading to build vocabulary. So this was a solution, but I think the, the definite positive is that it is tied to the student's login and clever. So when we have our systems in place that students can take devices home, they can actually read those books at home just like they can at school. And the other strength is that there are several titles that are either in primary language Spanish or translated versions so that that piece as well can be promoted in the home. So, you know, many of the books um, are interactive because they're on the technology, so if there's a word they don't know, they can click on it, get a definition, they can hear text read to them. So that's a little bit about the program. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, any other questions or comments? All right, ready to vote. Ms. O'Kelly. Aye. Clerk Lewis. Aye. Uh, Vice President Montez. Aye. And myself. Aye. Okay, F4, agreement with, with open arms, WOA, or whoa. Motion <laughs> a second, please. So move. move. Second. Okay. And this is to approve an agreement to utilize with open arms to provide outreach and support housing services to Rialto Unified School District families, including those that have been approved approved for three month fam I'm sorry approved for the three month emergency stay at the Wood Spring Suites for the term of August 26, 2021, through June 30th, 2022. The agreement will be for 40 families at a cost not to not to exceed. $1,950 per family for a total overall cost not to exceed $78,000 and to be paid from the general fund. Questions or comments, board? Just for clarification, um, so the public knows, this is, this is uh, help to assist families in our district uh, boarding, correct? That is correct. And please know that uh, this uh, subject came up uh, a few days ago as well as today uh, during one of our strategic planning sessions uh, with, uh, with the team, the planning team, Dr. Cook. The question was posed, can public education really continue the way that it is right now? Uh, with the understanding that it originated, you know, with the idea of providing uh, the supports to teach kids, uh, you know, literacy, uh, arithmetic, and a couple of other uh, very simple, uh, you know, subjects. But now, over the course of decades, it has, you know, come upon us that we address so many different things to really truly educate the whole child, which is something that Rialto is committed to. Absolutely. But the question I pose had to do with, okay, now we're venturing into this realm, I think is a noble thing for us to do. Mm -hmm. Is there a threshold to say if the economy continues or when it does worsen and families are affected, are we going to double or triple the amount to support our families 
as a way to support our kids because kids who don't have a place to stay will be affected and they probably won't uh, have that drive to learn anyway. Or do we, is there a, such a need that we then maybe need to hire internally a person that can help uh, be a case carrier for families who uh, become displaced? Or do we partner with uh, existing agencies to have that uh, support in place ongoing? Or do we uh, seek uh, funding? Do we seek grants to help us support so that we can, you know, not take money from the classroom <coughs> and into this area uh, ongoing in the future. So we're, uh, I'm asking staff to explore our possibilities mm -hmm. to make sure that this need is addressed, whether internally or in partnership or with additional outside funding to make sure that we continue with this noble effort. Um, I just want to say, mm -hmm. I just want to say thank you and your um, explanations. They're a lot more thorough and adding this case management component to it because you know, just placing a person in a hotel, that's going to end. But unless they have the case management, mm -hmm. and it's not only just for the people who have the stay, it's at risk. So, you know, people stay in their cars, they can be identified, mm -hmm. they might not get the home uh, hotel room, but they're couch surfing, they can go with the case management. So this was the part that was missing from the original, mm -hmm. and I'm glad you sort of picked up on there and partner, because you have to have a endpoint and a transitional and mm -hmm. these are the experts that can help them to more of a stable placement or prevent the total um, homelessness for the yes. kids. That, so would, that, thank wouldn't, you. that wouldn't be a bad idea, Dr. Avila. Yeah, that's, that's a great, great. idea to, to have somebody in house um, look at ways how we can help our students and their families. I, I just, you touched on something. I, I just wanted to thank our nutrition services department uh, for taking the lead. Uh, Way before the state now, the governor just announced that they're going to uh, allocate monies to make uh, lunches free for all mm -hmm. students mm -hmm. in California. Well, Rialto's been doing it exactly. because of the hardworking people here uh, in the district. And, um, and, it, and, and there are families in our community who could greatly benefit from some extra food. Right mm -hmm. now, as expensive as it is, mm -hmm. everything's gone up. Uh, you know, people talk about walking out of the grocery store with a hundred dollars worth of food in one bag yeah um so a little bag you know so yeah if, if if you guys could uh you know come up with something um in house that'd be better than partnering with somebody uh, a third party um you know and and uh they can they can do a lot of things like you said look for grants and whatnot and and um that'd be awesome yeah thank you okay. I really appreciate that um, the spirit here in Rialto is giving. It is um, the desire to continue is there. Whether the funding is there is another question. Whether it will remain there, it may become an un another unfunded mandate, which we have to fund anyway. It's, but uh, just as uh, my colleague said, We've already been funding and looking for funds to feed our community, not just kids. We need somebody to do it full time. Yeah, yeah, well, there's other know. organizations. Maybe we need to reach out to them. So thanks to everybody who's, who's helping everyone else out. Okay, uh, vote by board members. Aye. Um, thank you. Aye. Aye. And myself, aye. Okay, classified hourly salary increase. A so motion. Moved. So moved. Second. Second. Thank you. And this is to ratify a 5% increase to the classified hourly daily pay schedule, effective August 20th, 2021, at a cost of $301,649 and to be paid from the general fund. Questions or comments? If the board can give themselves 5%, I think everybody else deserves 5%. <laughs> Well, I know one of the reasons they uh, stated in the write-up is because uh, substitutes would get that 5%, and then Rialto can compete with neighboring districts that pay subs a little bit more than we do uh, mm -hmm. currently. So it's to put us on a le level playing field. And just yes. for comment, 
uh, on that. We, we are one of the higher paying uh, districts. In fact, uh, a colleague of mine announced at his management meeting a week or so ago addressing complaints that they were short on subs. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, Rialto has taken most of them. And so we do have a game plan. Oh, we're still short. Even in spite of that, we're still short. But uh, personnel and uh, our cabinet team, uh, innovation, we have a plan to uh, get us to another level to make sure that we minimize or eliminate all uh, sub shortages. Mm. Excellent. Yeah. I like the sound of it. OK, and uh, questions or comments? Well deserved. OK. Um, Ms. O'Kelly. Aye. Clerk Lewis. Aye. Vice President Montez. Aye. And myself. Aye. Now, uh, resolution number 202108, and this is the one that was supposed to read 212208, mm. if I remember right. And the next one as well, 212209. Okay, making my notes. All right, resolution number 212208 to authorize the increase of the existing board members monthly stipend by 5% pursuant to section 35120E of the education code. And to be clear, that's about $20. <laughs> and when was the last time you had a stipend to be we've clear? Um, never done we've it. never accepted one. Okay. We so move, motion. <laughs> we, uh, how do you say, uh, we fell asleep at the helm. We should have started it years ago, but we're doing it now. Well, I say it came up a couple times, but it was sort of pushed aside and <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. back in the days. Okay. And I see we have an attorney ready for questions. Mm. Wait, do we have a motion and a second? We have a motion second. and a second. Okay. All right. We are ready to entertain questions. Are you ready? I'm ready. Good, good evening, and thank evening. you, uh, members of the board, and <coughs> Dr. Avila, for inviting me here. I'm happy to entertain your questions, and I will provide you with the best answer possible. Okay, I'll go. Um, while we don't want to even consider back pay, we've missed 5% for, well, in my case, for 13 years, for some of them, 10 years. Can we, case, years, yeah. can we, pardon? And eight years? Ten, well, 10 years for me. Yeah, okay, yeah, so 12 for others here. Um, can we retro those, in other words, 5% from year one brought in and beginning this year, carry whatever that percentage works out to forward? Uh, thank you for that question. Um, and the statute 35120 of the Education Code doesn't specifically prohibit the retroactive uh, increases. Uh, however, it does contain language that implies that that is not permitted. So the board could take action subject to challenge. And I'll tell you why um, the language of the statute does imply that you cannot do it. The, the subsection of section 35120 uh, that applies here is subsection E. Mm -hmm. And that subsection says, on an annual basis, the governing board may increase the compensation of individual board members beyond the limits delineated in this section for those districts that are less than 25,000, that's $400 per month, in an amount not to exceed 5% based on the present monthly rate of compensation. And then it goes on to say, that's effective upon approval by the board. So when the statute describes an increase that the board can take on an annual basis based on the present monthly rate, um, the present monthly rate mm -hmm. is $400 per month here. And an increase on the present monthly rate would be an increase that's uh, based on a prospective basis. But mm -hmm. The statute does not state anything <coughs> related to uh, the governing board increasing in any amounts on prior monthly rates. Mm -hmm. And for that reason, I do believe that it is questionable as to whether or not the board could do a retroactive increase, even if the payment was not made for those prior years, uh, because the limitation would be 5% of 400 per month 
that could be applied towards your next payments that would be increased. Mm -hmm. so, so let me play devil's advocate here. So you're saying yes and no, and, <laughs> and it could be challenged, it, could be, it can be done, but it can't be challenged, if it's even challenged. Now, the law says you guys can, the board can authorize 5% uh, every year based on $400. Now, if the board were to make just a hypothesis here, if the board were to take action to increase the monthly s stipend uh, by 5% 5 per, uh, 5 retroactively, wouldn't that be the same as having taken action when we, when, uh, let's say the board wants to go back 10 years, just an example. Uh, the board says, hey, you know what? We've discussed this and honestly we believe 5% uh, retroactively for the last 10 years, just an example, um, is, is warranted. It's, 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 it's what the board feels it's deserving of community members who decide to take on these responsibilities. Had the board done it 10 years ago, till now, it would have been perfectly legal. Correct? So That's correct. So if the board were to take action to do it retroact retroactively, it would be the same thing now as, as if the board had done it 10 years ago. So the fact that the board didn't take action, um, it's, you know, it's like, it's understanding that someone will say, no, 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 well, too bad, you should have done it. But in reality, had the board done this five or 10 years ago, whatever, you know, retro if the board were ever considered doing it retroactively, it would be the same exact thing as if they had done it. So it's not like it's taking anything away that wouldn't, wouldn't have, have uh, happened had it taken action sooner. So I know maybe 10 years is too much. I don't know, but maybe two years, five years, I don't know. Um, but what I'm hearing from you is the board can do it, but it could be challenged. If I can respond, it's not common or typical for uh, us as a law firm for the Board of Education to be providing legal advice in public. So I, I want to be careful. Wait a minute, wait a minute, but you're here. <laughs> That's correct. And. I'm just, I'm just, I said I was going to play devil's advocate and, and I just wanted to throw it out there, but I, I am, I'm interested in having your legal opinion, otherwise what are you doing here? If it's the board's will, I'll let you know that I do believe that if challenged uh, the board's action to retroactively increase um, stipends for the board uh, per month would uh, not be not be resulting in an upholding of the board's action. I do believe it'd be overturned because of the use of the term present monthly rate. Mm -hmm. And I, I, uh, I understand where you're coming from and what you're saying. And I do believe that from a very legitimate rational perspective, um, catching up for prior inaction makes sense. However, uh, there are certain legal doctrines uh, that would require a court to look at the plain language of the statute and try to read that and interpret it to have meaning and the word present in the... Uh, well, it's been the present stipend for several years now. So if we were to look at it that way, then the present monthly rate can be increased every year not to exceed 5%. So if we're going to increase it this year, the action this year, cannot in exceed 5%. In the same way that if you have, for example, a loan with interest accruing in penalties that isn't paid for 12 months and there's a monthly payment due, if you pay at the end of 12 months and catch up for all the other payments, there, if there is per contract language a penalty and interest that's owed, that doesn't go away. I, the, I don't know if that's a good analogy to be honest with you. I'm just being honest with you. Well, there, yeah, there are many analogies. What I'm, what I'm trying to say is, even though 
functionally speaking, it would be convenient and make logical sense. If, it's, if it says no more than 5%, no more than 5% based on the current stipend, if, it, if, if I'm not saying that's what I'm encouraging anybody to do or this board is going to do it, but if the board were to, were to say, hey, we want to go two, three years retroactively, 5%, no more than the 5%, it's still the numbers. That's all I'm saying. You know, it's not like it's more, it's going to be, you know, more is going to be added. It clearly states no more than 5%. Well, it can still be done that way based on the math. So where is it, where would, would there be a violation where it's more than what it's limited to, which is the 5% per year? If we're saying that we're going to have 5% um, of an increase on $400 per month, and we're saying, well, it's been 400 per it's month. Per, no, it's per year. Well, right. if, if you add them up, 12 of those would make it per year as well. So if you were to do that, saying that it's been $400 per month for the past three years, and so now we're going to increase that 400 uh, to 420 per month, that's, that's completely within the scope of what's permitted under the statute. That's, that's what you're saying. Okay, but if question. you were to try to camp compound for three years, that would no, be a problem. No, 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 not compound it, just uh, equate it to the same amount of what it comes out to per year. So you're saying 15% if it were three years, the equivalent of having taken action three no, years no, back? No, 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 you can't do that because it's... Well, it's, I'm it's, trying to understand the question you're asking. That's what I'm asking is, that is like what, what the 5% per, per year based on the 5% per year because that's what it's capped at. Uh, so is the premise of the question, can we retroactively increase our pay and it be paid well, well, for prior years? Had, you, no, well, you've already told us that we can, but it can be challenged because there's, yes. no, lang there's no language that specifically says that a board cannot. Yes, that is correct. However, I do believe that subsection E would uh, be interpreted to imply that you cannot Question. because of the, the <clears throat> phrase present monthly rate. Question then. Um, I, I'm assuming that any taxpayer could challenge it. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. okay. Um, so I have another question regarding uh, like benefits. So can a board member with their stipend <coughs> um, in lieu, like maybe participate maybe in the district 401k instead of a cash uh, <coughs> the government code provides that health and welfare or health sorry health benefits can be uh, something that the board participates in so the 401k is not something that is is provided for <coughs> and i uh, do not believe that that would be within the scope of what you could do okay. any other questions I had to ask you at least one question. You came all the way down. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I appreciate have, your thoughts. I do have one other thing that I, I never asked. Please go ahead, Ms. O'Connor. I just like to point out that when we hear that major cities like L.A. and San Francisco, board members there make six-figure salaries a year, mm. and we get 400 bucks. I don't know who comes up with these rules about the number of students. We are right under the 25,000 mark. You know, there's some districts that have like 2,000. They're getting the same stipend we are. So where's the logic? But Ms. O'Kelly, we get paid by smiles. Just look around the room <laughs> right here. We get paid by smiles. Smiles don't buy my gas. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I've never gotten an answer because I've never asked it of an attorney. Uh, the same 35120, but I don't know what section. I believe it's number nine refers to one through seven 
and basically says that we can, when we went below 25,000, that we can refer back to 1998 <coughs> ADA and add that to the next year or years. Can you clarify that, please? Yes, and I have to say that uh, lawyers such as myself don't write these statutes. We just help to interpret them, and judges and lawyers have a very difficult time sometimes um, interpreting the education code and other codes because the legislature uh, does not always draft these codes very clearly or with um, uh, application in mind. So let me read to you the very short uh, provision you're mentioning, subsection 9 of subsection A or A9 of 31, 35, 120 says, for purposes of providing compensation pursuant to paragraphs one through seven, inclusive average daily attendance for the prior school year may be increased by a school's school district's percentage of excused absences reported for the 1996-97 fiscal year. So in the abstract, that seems to be somewhat um, Clear as mud? Well, right. questionable as to why that specific year and how that applies. So we did a little bit of research to find out what happened in 1996-97 and how that would have worked. And I, I want to mention that um, the district staff did a diligent effort in trying to obtain information regarding that, being that it's uh, nearly 25 years ago, um, that information was not readily available. Um, that it's just not something that's maintained. And the reason why it's not is because in 1996-97, there was a bill, SB 227, that changed the method of calculation of ADA. Mm -hmm. So prior to that bill being effective in 1997-98, ADA included excused absences. And the reason why this provision was added was so that when the ADA method of calculation was changed, you didn't have school districts being harmed financially by having that ADA count drop drastically. So there was a grandfathering in of the prior year's ADA based on the inclusion of the excused absences for that 97, 98 period. Mm -hmm. Based on the legislative history, um, this provision was intended to address that situation on a one-time basis to grandfather those districts in and not to apply on an ongoing basis every year. So that's okay. the way that it, it came into the statute and that's what it's supposed to mean, even though, as you said, it's clear as mud. <laughs> yeah, uh, written by, yeah, that, anyway. We're still smiling at this attorney. <laughs> And we I'm, I'm not certain those people were lawyers who read. I know you were going to say that, but I don't know if they were. They want to think of themselves as such. <laughs> but, uh, any other questions? No, I, I just want to say we appreciate your interpretations. Thank you for helping us out and helping us out in public. We want to be transparent on everything we do. If, if I could just let you know, a good lawyer will tell you the law, whether it's good or bad, so that you don't end up in court. I'm trying to do that for you. No, no, I appreciate that. I'm just kidding with you. Don't take it personal. <laughs> <laughs> I'm good. But, but no, we appreciate it. And, and um, uh, honestly, I don't think anybody in the community uh, would, would uh, if the board were to decide to look at this further, um, mm -hmm. challenging anything, especially if they're planning on running for the board someday. Mm -hmm. but, but thank you very much. Uh, uh, I truly appreciate it. And um, it's good to have these talks in public because they should be. They should yes. be public, and, and we should ask questions. And you know, what good is it to put this item on the agenda if no one's going to ask you any questions? And what good is it for you to come if no one's going to yeah. put you to work? So, okay, I can um, do it for you. I so failed to you. have you introduce yourself and your law firm. Well, uh, retroactively, I'll introduce myself, <laughs> Darren Kamea, partner of Lozano Smith. And thank you for having me. Some, sometimes it's allowed to be retroactive. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. All right. Board ready to take action? Mm-hmm. Okay. Miss um, O'Kelly? Aye. Okay. Uh, Clerk Lewis? Aye. Edgar Montez, Vice President? Aye. 
And being last on the agenda gives me the option, since it's already passed, to vote yes, no, or abstain, and I choose to abstain. That's one of the few times I became political on a vote. <laughs> okay, uh, F7, resolution number 212209. <clears throat> and let's see, resolution 212209 to initiate a, can't see again, a transition to by trustee area election system commencing with the 2022 governing board election. Okay, motion and a second, please. So move. Second. Thank you. And this is to adopt resolution number 212209 to initiate a transition to by area, by trustee area election system commencing with the 2022 governing board election. Questions or comments? Comment. I think uh, F7 really ties into F6 as we go into the district. Uh, people need to know um, about the board compensation and stipend and what are the restrictions as you, uh, there's a misconception. And I think it's timely that these both are in the same, being voted on at the same time. Thank you. We're okay. putting it on the agenda. I, yeah, I know. Man. Yes, please. I, I totally agree. I, I just, I just want to make it clear that I knew what I was getting into at least financially or uh, right. stipend benefit wise. Mm -hmm. But when we um, started, we had more students, so it was a bigger stipend. Yeah, it, I mean. as much. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, it's not the stipend, Almost. I just think yeah, it, it, you need to know as you go into district and you're dividing, and this is just information of how government and school board are different. A lot of people yeah. feel that it's city council, yeah. right. and it's not, and so no. that's why it's good to have this conversation, and it's good to have the public, and an attorney yeah. and the board ask pointed yeah. questions. When the city council or, people from where I understand or, get quite a bit of money. <laughs> or how many times have you heard those crooked money making stealing politicians <laughs> on the school board? Yeah, it needs to be open. Uh, yeah. Right. You know, like yeah, like if it's <laughs> like if it's a high paying job or something. But I, I just I just think that um uh to some board members or people who decide to run for board, um knowing that uh, the stipend is, is, is basically voluntarily, yes. basically voluntarily. Um, I think it's, it's just the, um, what, what you can give back to the community, mm -hmm. what you can, what you get back from taking part in being uh, part of a, of a governing body of, 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 mm -hmm. of the leadership um, mm -hmm. and being able to make a difference um, is more important than, than the stipend yes, or, the be is. or the benefits. Um, but yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't hurt. <laughs> <coughs> True, it doesn't. Um, okay, uh, ready to take action board? Before, President Martinez, before that, it's just a reminder, I know it was done at the beginning of adopting the agenda, but items F7, uh, F6 and F7 should read, 212208 and 212209. Those yep. changes were made, but I know they were read as they are right now. But just for the record, the, the numbering did change. Okay, I thought I read uh, the, the 2122, but that's okay. Yeah, on F6 you did. Yeah, I appreciate the correction. And uh, go ahead. Um, you have the floor still. No, no, I was just done. I, I just thought. Um, okay. okay. Uh, yeah, I, I think more important than the stipend is just to remember if anyone wants to run for board, the responsibility that comes with this role. Um, it's like it, it seems to be at times very powerless, but at the same time, it can be very powerful. And those of you who've been here know that, that you know, it, mm -hmm. we need to have the right people or at least good hearted people. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, you, you know, uh, it's. Uh, just like being a union president um, or a rep, it can be a very thankless job in trying times. Um, it it uh, is very rewarding. It is mm -hmm. also very challenging. It's very uh, uh, time consuming, um, but I wouldn't change it for the world. <laughs> and not, it's even, not even for retroactive. 
No, no, no. <laughs> and um, let's go. <laughs> okay, we're, are we ready to vote? Mm -hmm. Okay, my dog's at home waiting for me. Thank you. Aye. Thank you. <laughs> and I. I do wish to go back on F6. And even though I was going to vote no, I'm going to support my uh, board members and I'm going to vote yes. I don't want them standing out there by themselves. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. You are our leader. Thank you for not leaving. Which way did they go? <laughs> Thank you for not leaving and hanging high and dry. Thank you. Yeah, I'm not going to do that. It's, it's allowed, but no, it didn't feel right. Okay, reinstatement. Motion any second. So move. Second. Thank you. And this is for case 192046. Uh, questions or comments? And this is reinstating students. Uh, they've fulfilled their, their obligations and wish to come back. And the board is either accepting them yay or nay. So, uh, Ms. O'Kelly, how do you Aye. Do? Clerk Aye. 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 And I. Welcome back. All right, adjournment. Before we adjourn, I would like to adjourn uh, wishing uh, Vice President Montes a happy birthday. <laughs> happy birthday. Okay. Shall, shall we all croak in, in tune here? I was like, I almost, I almost made it. <laughs> Thank you. All right, you ready? Oh, no, no, no. This happy birthday, birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Edgar. dear Edgar. Edgar. Happy birthday to you. And many more. Thank you. <laughs> Happy it, birthday, my friend. Thank you. It was just as embarrassing as Black Angus the other day. Thank you. <laughs> more so, this just can kidding. be replayed. Well, thank you, guys. Thank you. <laughs> That's QOD 29. Oh, 42 feels good. Lots yeah. of red hair. You know? Earning my stripes, thank you. <laughs> okay, board members, remember we have to meet in the uh, closed session room. Okay, the next regular meeting of the Board of Education of the Rialto Unified School District will be held on Wednesday, September 8th, 2021 at 7 p.m. at the Dr. Cas John Casalunas Education Center, 182 East Walnut Avenue, Rialto, California. Materials distributed or presented to the Board of Education at the board meeting are available upon request from the superintendent's office. Motion a second to adjourn. So moved. Second. All right. And everybody in unison. Aye. 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 <laughs> Time 842.